please know I am but a humble raven puff and do not own or take credit for any of the magical fan fictions on this podcasting channel. Nor do I own any rights or magical say on J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter characters that are mentioned within these stories. These fan fictions are the result of much more creative and dedicated minds than my own, and I will be introducing these authors as well as where to find their other works at the beginning of every episode. Hello, my magical brethren, and welcome to Fox's Fix, a podcast that attempts the sonorous charm on some of your favorite Harry Potter fan fictions. So whether you're taking the night bus across town, denoming your garden, or simply shopping through Diagon Alley, this is a podcast that allows even the busiest witches and wizards a chance to listen to their favorite fan fiction. So I'd say it's time we take a page out of Fox's book and light up this week's fan fiction. Fox's Fix presents the unabridged audiobook of Isolation, written by Bex Chan and narrated by Fox's Fix. Bex Chan's novel-length fanfiction can be located on fanfiction.net as well as archiveofourown.org. Warning, this fanfiction is rated mature for its explicit language, content, and themes. Chapter 13 Alone. Hermione could never recall feeling so warm and content. She released a lazy hum as the rhythmic falls of a masculine chest lulled her back to that wonderful purgatory between sleep and reality. A tasty smell of peppermint and sinful Slytherin tickled her nose and she blinked away the remains of a blissful dream as she suddenly remembered where she was. Judging by the heavy breaths toying with her hair, Draco was very much ignorant to the world, but his arms must have snaked around her during the night, and she couldn't help but push her body a little more into his. He just felt so good wrapped around her like this and she wanted to absorb as much as she could before the inevitable denial and arguments came. Frowning at that thought, she realized it was probably best she leave before he stirred, if only to save them both the embarrassment and the hassle. Unsure why, but unable to resist, she craned her neck to plant a lingering kiss against his jaw before carefully removing herself from his hold. The absence of his touch left her feeling neglected and cold, and as an afterthought, she pulled up one of Draco's blankets to cover him. With a final sad look, Hermione turned to leave, oblivious to the set of gray eyes slowly opening behind her. Draco brought his fingertips to where her lips had been and stared at her back as she left him alone. But before he could think twice about her lingering kiss, a random idea stole his brain and he silently eased himself up, just managing to catch the door before it closed behind her. He poked his head through the gap and strained his hearing ability to successfully catch her password to her bedroom door. Lutra Lutra. What the? He had no idea what it meant, nor did he really care. He just felt satisfied that things could be a little fairer now. If she was so bloody eager to wander into his room whenever she liked, now he could do the same. He told himself it was purely for tactical purposes. But as he raised his fingertips again to his Granger Gray's jaw, he couldn't help but wonder if there were darker motives to his prying actions. After a light lunch and a trip to the library, Hermione had returned to her room to find Hedwig pecking at her window. Hermione read the letter again and again, her smile widening. The envelope had been addressed solely to her, so she hadn't tracked down Ginny this time. After weeks of nothing but disappointment, as fuel to her ever-growing pessimism, finally, 
there was light in the darkness. The note was scrawled in Ron's familiar and clumsy handwriting this time, but the words were bold and clear across the parchment. We found it. It's destroyed. Searching for the others. I miss you. R and H. There was no question about what it was. They had found the locket. But her curiosity about the details would have to wait. She knew it was far too risky for Harry and Ron to provide her with too much information via Owl. But for the moment, she didn't care. For they were one step closer to defeating Voldemort and ending this bloody war. But as she remembered Ron's words, I miss you. Her broad grin creased into a sad frown as a spell of guilt hit her hard. Visions of her recent activities with Draco waltzed across her conscience, and she realized with a cringe that she hadn't once considered how her behavior would affect her friendships with the boys, specifically Ron. The details of her relationship with him were complicated, to say the least, and she guessed she should probably blame them both for never having a civilized conversation about the subject. While she didn't regret losing her virginity to her best friend, it had been made perfectly clear to her that that was all she and Ron would ever be. Friends. There had never been any passion between them, just crushes and curiosity that had been, for her, sated. She loved him dearly, but she wanted that lust that she had heard so much about, that burning throb inside your soul that made you crave someone's touch. And that someone just wasn't Ron. But... Draco. Draco had this intensity with everything he did, and it made something behind her navel tingle. A sensation was new and foreign to her, and she had no idea if she could call it lust or simply intrigue. But it was different, and therefore, exciting. It encouraged her to interact and watch him, and in the safe solitude of her showers or her room, sometimes she couldn't help but imagine. She shook her head to chase away the risque thoughts and reminded herself that she had just received some promising news. Ugh, priorities, Hermione. Priorities. After two days of awkward glances and an obvious reluctance to address the night spent in forbidden arms, Hermione was beginning to realize she quite missed Draco's company. She was still struggling to really identify what she truly felt for her Slytherin housemate, but she had done her best to ignore her curiosity and instead focus on her Horcrux research but she couldn't deny her interest in him, nor could she really figure out why she desired to spend time with him in the first place, when all they seemed to do was fight. Perhaps it was because she could see him slowly dropping his defenses, or possibly because the arguments reminded her that she still had some fire thundering in her bones. Hell, Maybe she just enjoyed the spasmodic little flutters that crowded her gut whenever they were close in proximity. It was Tuesday, meaning she would be leaving in two days to visit Tonks, and she still needed to tell Draco. Smothering her anxiety and stealing her courage, she slipped out of her room, urged on by the wind slashing the night, and tapped lightly against his door. Why do you even bother knocking? Draco's voice called from inside. You will come in whether I say you can or not. She found a little smile toying with her mouth 
as she used her wand to unlock his door, and she licked her dry lips before patting her bare feet over his threshold. He was sitting on his bed, shoulders hunched over and elbows resting against his crossed legs, while one of her books lay discarded near his feet. What do you want, Granger? he asked, barely offering her a sideways glance. I want to talk to you about something. And you decided that three in the morning was the best time to bring it up? I've been busy, she lied, carefully easing herself down to sit at the foot of his bed. And we're both up, so I figured... Spit it out then, he said tiredly. Unlike you, I actually planned on getting some sleep tonight. Okay, she sighed hesitating as she tried to select her words. On Thursday, I shall be staying at Hogsmeade for a couple of days. What? He blurted. His head snapped up at her words, and a violent sense of dread seized his chest. The thought of her leaving him alone, in this sanity-starving hole, made him feel sick to his stomach, and an itchy shiver clawed its way up his spine. What the hell do you mean you're leaving for a couple of days? Well, I'm visiting someone, she explained, nervously tucking an unruly curl behind her ear. I will leave you with enough food and... Don't tell me you're going with that corner prick, he hissed quietly, fixing her with a fierce glare. Romantic fuckfest for the heads of the three broomsticks? Hermione flinched. No, that's not it. Ugh, I suppose I should be grateful that you're not denting the headboard in your own room, that I have to listen to it, he continued viciously. And if you continue to slag it around, then... Draco, stop! She barked with offense, and I could see the shadows of tears scratching at her eyes. I'm meeting a female friend, for Godric's sake! Why do you always have to do that? His mouth clapped shut as he willed his stormy thoughts to simmer, and he wondered, why did he find his rant necessary? He considered the possibility that she was just bluffing to save face, but he doubted Granger was capable of lying, and in a world riff with deception, he actually found her honesty rather refreshing. I- I'm sorry. The words were rushed and tumbled past his lips before he could stop them. But, for a brief moment, he thought the charming softening of her features might actually be worth his error. The way she looked at him then, like he was worth something. Worth more than the pitiful mess he felt. Made that incessant craving to touch her tickle his fingertips. I, I'm sorry that I won't be here for a couple of days, she said, before he could retract his apology, and he found himself weaving his fingers together to keep his hands busy. I will arrange some way for you to contact me if there's anything you need. I am perfectly capable of surviving two days by myself, he scoffed quickly, but the idea of her not being around to chase away the boredom actually made his soul ache. It's honestly a bloody shame you don't fuck off more often. You have been more cheerful recently, he commented suddenly, giving her a suspicious stare. It's annoying. Hermione frowned and wondered if her reaction to Ron's letter had been a bit more obvious than she thought. What makes you think I'm happier? It's written all over your face, he said with a roll of his smoky eyes. And if I'm guessing right, this friend that you were meeting in Hogsmeade is one of your order lot. Would I be right in assuming that your side is doing well? And that is to blame for your good mood? You know I can't discuss that with you. Why not? He countered. I'm hardly going to walk out the front door and spill all your secrets to the man who wants me dead. Hermione exhaled wearily, 
and swiveled her body to face him. I just don't think we should talk about it. I'm sure everyone else is talking about it, he muttered thoughtfully. Why should we be any different? Because, because we are different, Draco, she told him, somewhat sadly. We are on different sides, he finished for her, bowing his head to hide his eyes. Hermione tilted her head, confused about the trace of melancholy in his tone. He looked troubled tonight as though a horde of questions were streaming across his brain, and he had no idea which one to answer first. She could see the muscles of his face were strained, in attempt to keep whatever was brewing in his head hidden from her, perhaps even hidden from himself. That rare bearing of vulnerability was there again, in the subtle twitch of his lips, or the anxious flicks of his fingers, and she wondered when she had learned to read him so well. Yes, different sides, she repeated in a solemn tone. Do you, you still consider yourself one of them, Draco? Hmm, that was the question, wasn't it? He swallowed away a clot of angst in his throat and bit down hard on his tongue. It was the question he'd been asking himself since he had been forced on the run. For how could he truly be a part of a side whose leader wanted him rotting in a shallow grave? That question had grown louder and dominant ever since Granger had started to invade his senses. Everything in his life was monumentally fucked up at the moment, but she seemed to be the only steady, and dare he think it, good aspect of his pathetic pseudo-life as a prisoner. He may detest the way he reacted to her and yearned for her company when she was away, but there was no denying her presence soothed his fractured soul. Sodding hell... Salazar, forgive me for that. But he couldn't help it. She was the first and only person to make him challenge the beliefs that had been engraved into his skull. How could he realistically follow the psychopathic ideals of that creature when he'd been the one to put a price on his own head? How could he really believe that Muggleborns were inferior? when Granger was the brightest witch to stumble into Hogwarts for decades. How could he pretend that those prejudices still made sense? Don't you? He asked her absently, removing his bare arm from under the blanket to display his mark. Doesn't this make me one of them? Hermione frowned at the ugly and twisted blemish on his snowy skin and was surprised to find that it didn't bother her anymore. Not on him, anyway. Perhaps it was the slightly softer edge of his voice tonight or the defeated slump in his shoulders, but she felt like pushing the boundaries with her struggling companion. She shuffled a little closer and carefully reached out to stroke her fingers across his still healing flesh, and felt encouraged when he didn't immediately snatch his arm away from her. That mark doesn't define you, she said gently, catching his confused eyes purposely. The same way my blood doesn't define me. You define who you are, Draco. Your actions and your thoughts. And, and if I don't know who I am? He questioned, his voice quivering slightly. What if, what if I'm lost? A scary bout of affection soared in her chest. Then just do what feels right, she urged eagerly, and the rest will follow. Draco's brow creased, and his distant stare fell to her calming fingers 
still softly teasing the sensitive scar on his forearm. Just when Hermione thought he was beginning to absorb her words, he snorted and pulled away from her two tempting caresses. You Gryffindors are so quick to seek the good in people, to assume people can change. He scorned with a questionable mirth. Some people are beyond change, Granger. Not you, she protested quickly. Not you, Draco. Doubt flickered in his ashy glare, but she could see he was determined to resist her tonight. You should go, he told her, nodding his head towards the door. She contemplated telling him that she wanted to stay, to surrender some of her pride and admit that she felt safe with him, and that she'd never slept better in her life than when she had been locked in his arms. But the prospect of him laughing in her face and rejecting her made the cold scratch across her skin, and she decided not to push her luck tonight. Leaving his bed, she headed out of his room, but paused in the doorframe. They're just labels, you know, she mumbled, keeping her back to him so he wouldn't see the first tear roll down her cheek. Slytherin, Gryffindor, pure blood and mud blood. These labels, they don't dictate how we live our lives. Behind her, Draco fought hard to ignore the quickening thuds against his ribcage. As she disappeared, he glanced down at his mark again and could still feel the lingering tingles from her touch. He felt so alone, almost aware that the flimsy remains of his stubborn prejudices were starting to shatter and crumble under the weight of her words. He knew that in her absence, even if it was only for a couple of days, it would do damaging things to his muddled brain. As if to confirm that he had finally yielded to the somewhat blissful beginnings of madness, he waited an hour before he crept soundlessly out of his room and found himself outside of her door. He toyed with the thought of murmuring her password and slipping inside, but he had no idea what he intended to do once he was in. Ugh, you pathetic twat. Michael and I agreed on the 11th of December for the Christmas ball, Hermione explained. I know it's a little earlier than usual, but you mentioned that you might have some problems with the transportation for some students this year. Yes, that is true. McGonagall nodded. I've decided it's wise to send smaller groups of students home for the holidays this year, over a period of a week or so, just in case. I'm not sure using Hogwarts Express is a good idea either, but there are alternatives. The eleventh works well. Hermione sighed and rubbed her eyes. Do we have to continue with this charade, Professor? She asked wearily. It just, it just seems so silly to have a ball when we are at war. You know I want to keep spirits up, the headmistress said evenly. Hogwarts is acting as a haven for now, and I would like for the students to feel safe here. But they... The eleventh is fine, Hermione. The older witch hushed her. Classes will finish on the tenth and that provides myself and the other professors with two weeks to ensure everyone gets home safely. Are you staying here at Hogwarts for the holidays then, Miss Granger? Yes, she replied a little sadly. I've told my parents that I'm staying at the borough. They still don't really know much about what's been going on, and I'd like to keep it that way. McGonagall creased her brow. Have you given any more thought to that memory charm you discussed with me? It's a last resort, Hermione told her professor quickly. I don't want to use it unless I absolutely have to. Well, 
Let's just hope that things don't come down to that, McGonagall sighed. On a more positive note, I've heard from Nymphadora and she is expecting you whenever you are ready. Hermione's stress features instantly brightened with that information. (gasps) I can't wait to see her, Hermione confessed. Do you need anything from me, Professor? Or can I? You are more than welcome to go. McGonagall offered with a warm expression. Would you like me to get Professor Slughorn to escort you? I'll be fine, Hermione assured quickly, rising from her seat. I need to head back to my dorm first anyway. Very well, the headmistress nodded. I shall see you in Transfiguration tomorrow then. And I expect you to be at that Christmas ball, Hermione. Ugh, great. Okay, Hermione nodded reluctantly. I'll see you tomorrow then, Professor. Hermione anxiously drummed her fingers against the wall next to Draco's door. She had been lingering in the same spot for close to five minutes now, wondering why she felt so concerned about her parting words to the blonde house guest. Since their reasonably intense conversation, she had kept her distance, deciding that she had once again probably surrendered too much of her hope to him. But he had been so human, practically bleeding at a level of vulnerability that had left her with trusting heart flutters and a whole new batch of emotions that she didn't understand. What if, what if I'm lost? She could have cried for that comment. His customary arrogance had momentarily melted away to show her that perhaps all of her efforts haven't been in vain. Maybe she had nourished that seed of doubt in his mind, enough that it was finally starting to blossom. Or maybe she was just getting ahead of herself. His flash of decency had diminished so quickly that she was beginning to wonder if it had happened at all. Granger, is there a bloody reason you're loitering outside of my room? His voice disrupted her thoughts, muffled through the thick wooden door in front of her. Taking a deep breath, she pushed it open and found him, once again, casually sitting on his bed with one of her books in his lap. Sorry, she mumbled. Am I interrupting you, or... Yes, because I have so much on my plate at the moment, he said snidely, rolling his eyes. What do you want, Granger? I'm leaving for Hogsmeade now, she told him. I have prepared enough food for you to last the two days and... Sawed off, then, Draco spat coldly. What were you expecting, Granger? A fucking farewell party? I wasn't expecting you to be so angry, she murmured, taking some steps towards him. And I certainly don't know why you're so angry. Neither did he. I'm not angry, he defended quickly. I just don't understand why you found it necessary to barge in here and bore me with your shit. Again. You told me you were leaving the other day. Yes, but I... Are you done? He snapped. I might have sought all to do, but I'd rather do it without you here. Hermione sighed and turned to rummage in her charmed bag, in which she had stored all of her belongings she would need for her stay with Tonks. After a couple of shakes, she removed a small snow globe containing a miniature replica of the Hogwarts castle inside, surrounded by fake snow. Draco arched an eyebrow as she rested the little object in her lap and stroked the glass thoughtfully before she caught his eyes. I've charmed this, she said slowly. If you shake it five times, it will set off an alarm on my clock. I've extended the wards too, so if you try to leave, that will also set off an alarm. He shouldn't have really been impressed with Granger's magical abilities. But once again, he found himself with an unwelcome sense of admiration for her. 
He scowled away any semblance of respect that could have betrayed him, and instead released a haughty scoff. I don't need. It's just a precaution, she interrupted him, in case you fall and break your leg or something. Wishful thinking there, Granger, he said with an easy smirk. You haven't lined the dorm with traps, have you? Hermione's lips twitched into an almost smile, and she edged forward to place the snow globe next to Draco on the bed. The flash of humor that suited his features so well faded away as he eyed her dainty item with distaste and pushed it away from him, and Hermione wanted very much at that moment to touch him. The temptation hit her so quickly and so suddenly that she flinched, clenching her hands into tight fists in an effort to ignore the tightening in her stomach. You know, Draco, she mumbled uneasily, frowning when her voice hitched. I could make other arrangements. If, if you don't want me to go, that is. You only have to say. Don't. Don't go, he thought. But instead, Draco growled. If you have no more pointless toys in your little bag of tricks, then I see no reason for you to still be here, Granger. She was certain he could see the disappointment behind her lashes, but it quickly turned into irritation. Fine, she said briskly. If you insist on being so bloody cold all the time, then I wasn't expecting you to be so angry. He repeated her earlier words condescendingly. Was there something else you wanted, Granger? No, she huffed, swiftly rising from his bed. I just don't understand why you have to be such a bastard all the time. Hey, he shouted, quickly standing up and grabbing her wrist. What the hell were you expecting, Granger? Some gratitude for this poxy ornament? When you're leaving me alone in this sodding prison? I am learning to expect nothing from you. She fired back, bringing her face close to his. Just when I think you might have a shred of decency in you, you go right back to being a selfish prick. What the hell are you talking about? The other day, Hermione reminded him in a quieter voice, when we were talking about sides. Ugh, you read too much into things. Did you ever think that maybe this place is just screwing with my head? Not as much as you'd like to think, she retorted, swallowing when she realized just how close they were. Draco, why do you have to put on an act when I'm the only one that sees you? There was something familiar in her golden eyes that reminded him of the day she had kissed him in her allergy-stricken haze. It was there, between her anxious blinks, a spark of courage amongst her storm of nerves, and he felt her lean into him. He clenched his eyes shut and debated, allowing this to happen, tempted to just drop all of his defenses and let her do what she wanted. This was his only opportunity to get a final dose of her, that forbidden fix, before she left him alone with his demons. They had grazed lips before, so what difference would it make to taste her once more? But when her warm breath ghosted across his chin, it dragged Draco back to reality, and he hastily shoved her away before she could touch him. He sneered viciously at her, but the venom in his features was forced and practiced, simply a mask to cover how disoriented he felt. Granger, on the other hand, had no time to hide her humiliation and surprise, her movements jerky and her eyes misted with hurt. Draco was a heartbeat away from screaming at her to leave, but she whirled around on her own and fled before he could even draw a breath. The slam of the door ricocheted around his lonely room, like the clap of the wizard Gamot's hammer. Thus was his sentence. Two days with only his shadow for company, and wondering what he would do without her presence to chase away the damning solitude. <sighs> Sodding hell. He should have just let her kiss him.
The cold air made her tear-sodden eyes sting. Hermione's walk to Hogsmeade was a rushed one, plagued with the realization that she was beginning to feel things for Draco that were far from normal. The first time she had kissed him, she had been woozy and dazed, acting on a commanding impulse that had been too much for logic to repress. But her attempt to catch another taste, just moments ago, had been different. She had wanted to lean in and test her luck. It had been a conscious decision, and that had resulted in her feeling rejected and completely mortified. The thoughts in her brain were muddled and mangled into a catastrophic mess, and she had no idea where to even begin with dealing with them. As the three broomsticks came into view, she sleeved away all the evidence from her cries and tried to gather her composure. At least the excitement of seeing Tonks would drown some of her questions about Draco and she managed a half-hearted smile as she entered the familiar inn. A few of the usual punters were scattered around, but she barely noticed them when she caught Madame Rose Murda's wise eyes. The older witch offered Hermione a knowing nod and discreetly passed her a key across the bar, and Hermione wasted no time in rushing to see her friend. There she is. I thought you might have lost your way. Tonks beamed as Hermione barged into the room. Oh, Tonks, it's so good to see you. Hermione gushed, rushing in for a hug but faltering when she spotted the slight swell of Tonks' stomach. Oh, Tonks, you're starting to show. Meet the bump, Tonks said with a playful grin. And I'm warning you now that I'm going through the craving stage, so if you see me huddled in the corner, clutching a mama diet and jam sandwich, just ignore me. Hermione smiled, but she couldn't quite manage the laugh that would have normally come so naturally with Tonks' humor. An image of her encounter with Draco, when his lips had been barely a breath away from hers, danced across her eyelids and left her mouth feeling dry and her heart heavy. You all right, Marnie? Tonks asked. You look a bit troubled. I'm fine, Hermione lied quickly. I just, I just miss Harry and Ron. Of course you do. Tonks nodded sympathetically, giving the younger witch a warm smile. But at least you have some friends here who you can talk to. How are things at Hogwarts? Hermione couldn't help but flinch. Complicated. Draco scowled into the darkness. It was late, and the glow of the moon didn't reach the windowless living room, where the silence was ringing in his ears. A loud reminder that she wasn't here. Her scent was starting to fade, and the dorm felt eerily hollow. And all he had done for the last several hours was stare at that fucking snow globe. All he had to do was rattle the ugly thing and she would return and he could steal a taste of her as he should have done before she left. He lunged at the magical ornament and hurled it against the wall with a loud roar ripping through his windpipe. He watched it shatter against the wall before he turned on his heel and marched toward Granger's room. Mumbling her password, He instantly calmed as he greedily inhaled the air in the room. (sighs) Definitely Granger. He studied his surroundings critically, expecting to find a huge collection of personal belongings. But except for a few photographs, the predictable red bedding, and an impressive collection of books, it was similar to his own room. Draco eyed the photograph sourly, lingering on a particular one with Granger and those feckless pricks she considered good company. He slapped all the frames down so he wouldn't have to look at them and settled himself on her bed, absently running his fingertips over her covers. His lids felt heavy as he leaned back, 
lulled by how strong her scent was amongst her pillows and blankets. If he slept here, surrounded by soothing whispers of her presence, who would know? Sought it. And he settled into her bed. This has been an unabridged audio chapter of Isolation, written by Bex Chan and narrated by Fox's Fix. A special thank you goes out to Bex Chan for allowing me the privilege to read her story. To recommend your favorite Harry Potter fanfiction for future audiobook episodes, please visit Fox Fix Facebook page and Instagram through the links located in our description below. You can also help support us with donations through our PayPal account to help produce and shape in our future narrated fanfictions. Thank you for listening. Please join us next week for a continuation of this magical fanfiction. See you then!